Well, hello everybody. This is our second uh, video this week regarding corrections. So we need to uh, take down what we have here left over from first and put up a new one. And so what we're talking about is part two. And note that there are PowerPoints that go along with this. Uh, this is corrections, like we said. Uh, we're going to get a little deeper uh, into the process. Uh, and so uh, what we want to talk about uh, in this is that uh, we are looking at the, some basic theories and philosophies of, um, of corrections. And so some of the early things, I'm going to break them down one by one, but uh, just knowing what we're talking about here, we're going to talk about basic theory of just desserts, we're going to talk about deterrence, specific in general, we're going to talk about incapacitation, retribution, rehabilitation, and restoration. And these are all pretty popular theories that are out there now, and many of them are uh, still in vogue. There are also some other theories uh, of corrections out there that we're not covering here, but we may pick them up a little later on in the course. So uh, just to get a basic thumbnail, just desserts. Uh, it's a weird word, just desserts. I'm going to put it up here. Uh, the problem with it is, the accepted spelling of it is, is deserts, like the desert. But the thing is that the word actually comes from the 1300s. It's based on a root the, from France, actually. Uh, and uh, basically it's interpreted as justly deserved, okay? Justly deserved, okay? so. Uh, desserts is uh, just uh, a word and when you think about it if you think about dessert in the more modern sense with the two S's uh, if you have you know been a good boy or a good girl and so your mother really wants to take good care of you then she gives you dessert because you deserve it because you've been a good girl or good boy you get your dessert so even though it is a common uh, argument that comes up, why do we spell deserts as dessert? Well, it's because it's an old, old term. It goes way back, and it's been used in common parlance among uh, criminal justice uh, professionals for many, many years. One of the earliest ones, for example, is Beccaria. Beccaria, and he is one of the earliest uh, people that came up with these theories. He wrote a book in 1764. He was actually so afraid that this book would upset people that he, uh, you know, used a different name. He, he published it anonymously. Well, finally, it was so highly acclaimed uh, that even kings and people like that were saying, my goodness, what a great, great book. And so what he was saying when we say just desserts is, justly deserved is what we call proportion. Proportion or proportionality. Okay? Now I cannot promise that I'm always going to spell stuff right, so check it. So this is crime and punishment and it's actually on crime and punishment and I would like to get my hands on one of those manuscripts uh, and basically it's worth some ton of money if it's an original. So uh, one of my old friends, one of my doctoral instructors, Dr. Martin, would bring some of these old books that he collected and they would be preserved uh, in uh, bags and things that have carefully preserved. Uh, and many of them, the spine was broken and things like that, but you're better off not to even try to fix them because by fixing them, you make them worth less money. But a very interesting uh, book and, uh, you know, here again he was a great uh, proponent of this concept of proportionality and what that means is let the punishment fit the crime okay so if you steal a chicken for example we shouldn't cut your hand off okay punishment fits crime okay that's what it's really all about and uh, so basically, uh, as time has passed, that we have, this is so embedded in our thinking in, in the United States that we um, generally have adopted it, consider it all the time, and don't even realize where it comes from. 
there's another great person, and PowerPoints again are just a short kind of introductory overpass of what all we're going to be looking at. But there's another guy that's very uh, instrumental in the thinking on crime and corrections. The guy's name is Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham. And Jeremy was uh, also living in this time period. He kind of picked up on uh, Cesar Be Beccaria's ideas and carried them forward. Uh, and of course he's from England. Uh, he is an amazing guy because he developed a lot of different things. He was one of these Renaissance thinkers, uh, kind of like Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson really liked a lot of his ideas. So uh, he's into proportionality. But his big contribution is what we call utilitarianism. I'm sounding it out for myself, not just for you. Uh, and so basically what we mean by utilitarian is uh, it needs to be uh, good for most of the people. So in other words, a few people at times have to make sacrifices for the good of the all. Let, let us take examples. Uh, our military, for example, makes tremendous sacrifices. Uh, here, here's just a quick personal example. I don't want to belabor this, but uh, yesterday was my son and daughter-in-law's wedding anniversary. They've been married, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, seems like a, de a day, maybe a year, but it's more like five years now. So basically, where they were, they had their anniversary yesterday. Well, where was my son? My son was out on the high seas uh, in the Pacific Ocean, serving in the United States Coast Guard and trying to interdict drugs and uh, illegal immigrants and things like that. So he's doing his job for his country, and you know, you'll hear about him again. Unfortunately, I can't help myself. I'm so very proud of him. But anyway, these are the sacrifices that our military make for us every day. Nobody knows uh, fully the sacrifices that even military wives make for their husbands. And I honor that so much. And I'll talk about it in here because I see it in my own family. Um, everybody in my family, they're different generations. Not Well, not everybody, but let's say every generation has a representative that serve substantial time in the military, and I'm proud to say that I'm one of those people. But anyway, that part that the military serves is what we call utilitarianism. Now, taken to a larger extent, uh, our society, in a larger society, you know, we want to live free. We want to be free, okay? So freedom, military protects our freedom, okay? Well, what makes a crime a crime? In a truly free society, it would be anarchy. There would be no laws. There would be no rules. Anybody could do anything to anybody at any time because they're free. They can do what they want to do, okay? And Jeremy Bentham says that in order to fashion an ordered society, ordered society, orderly, in other words, uh, uh, basically, so that in other words, we know where we're going. So we take off to go to work today like I did. I didn't hit anybody else because there's stop signs. This is what is required. So I had to stop sometimes so these other 12 cars could go. So in a utilitarian philosophy, the most good for the most people, those 12 got to go first because they were on the major road. I was on the minor road. So basically you've got, you know, you've got a major highway like this. This is coming out of my addition. And you know, you got a, it's got a center line and there's cars, 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 you know, cars, 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 and then there's just little old me right here. And I'm wanting to go this way. Uh, but basically, I gotta wait. I have to wait. Why do I have to wait? Because of utilitarianism, okay? Well, in the same ilk, if I chose not to wait and I pulled out and I hit somebody, what would that mean? Well, I mean, I violated the law, okay? I was a criminal. I broke the law, okay? And so if we broke the law, basically, that makes us a criminal. Why are we criminals? I thought I was free. Well, you're not free to do just anything you want to do. Because in a well-ordered society, okay, basically what we're saying is that Certain people have to sacrifice their freedom. We all have to sacrifice a little of our freedom 
in order for the safety and good order of our society, okay? So if we look at our Constitution, we look at all the things that help us understand the way our government works, it all springs out of Jeremy Bentham, okay? So that's a little bit of an added value for you, okay? I want to talk about something else real quick, and I want to bring this forward because there are many, many older uh, individuals who have come forward with ideas and so I want to talk and he's not you know that old but uh, there's a guy here named Andrew Von Hirsch and basically he came out with a book and working a little bit here on trying to help you with your APA citation uh, doing justice in 1986 No, you don't even really need that, okay? But it's a nice short title so we can hit it real quick. Uh, and so, but basically once you do that, then you're going to have the city, which is Boston, Massachusetts. And then you, you need the commas in there. Uh, and basically what we're trying to say is this is how you cite this book that I'm going to talk to you about right now, okay? Now, wait a minute. I've got to get this right. Thank goodness for erasers. They need a great big fat eraser like that on my pencil. So, Northeastern University, okay? And this would be publishing, because a lot of these big universities have their own publishing house, okay? And it's in Boston, but they actually hire a printer outside the city. But notice how it uh, is. If there's this gap here, it's an indentation. We call this the hanging indentation, okay? And if I want to cite uh, this book in my title uh, or in my uh, paper, then in the reference section I would have Von Hirsch A, not Andrew Von Hirsch, but Von Hirsch A, and then 1986, you have the year, and then you have the title, then you have the city and state where it was published, and then you have the name of the publisher. This is on a book, okay? When we come to a peer-reviewed journal, and I'll work on that at another time, <coughs> I will help you understand that. Well, I want to share something else on this with you, and that is, I found this book online at one of these bookstores that you can find, an online bookseller, and it's in the PowerPoint. I think it cost me 25 cents or, or a dollar, okay? This is one of the original copies. Now this is not a collector version like the Crime and Punishment that I'd like to get my hands on, but basically what I'm trying to say to you is if you're serious about corrections as a career as I am, then you need to start gathering up a few of these books that you can always look back to in order to develop your own thoughts and draw them, you need expert help in developing your ideas. So this book here, my, like five dollars with the shipping, okay? So it's a dollar plus five, uh, or a dollar plus four, whatever it works out to be. Some of these I get for 25 cents, okay? And this is a more modern version, even though it's a 1986. Uh, but this is a very good book in terms of this whole notion of uh, proportionality, just desserts, and uh, these other important issues. This book, very good, Doing Justice, The Choice of Punishments, comes really right into play in this area that we're talking about in this course. Now, it's not required, but what I'm saying to you is try to get your hands on a copy. Libraries may have it. But I'm saying that for five bucks, if you've got a MasterCard or a Visa or whatever, uh, go to Better World Books or Abe Books or one of these off-sites, and you can pick these up for a little of nothing. And there's a bunch of them, and I'm going to bring one up in most of my PowerPoints because I've got a whole shelf full of them, and just show you what's out there that can help you with some of these different theories. So this can be helpful. It's a lot more modern than the uh, Beccaria version. But still, of course, not uh, as modern as some. 
Well, uh, this moves us on to another important notion, and that is the idea of deterrence. Let me first say that, you know, I've got about 30 years of experience in this, and I, I have to say that I, I basically have a basic prejudice. Here is the thing. I don't believe in deterrence. I just don't believe in it. Uh, you know, with no treatment of any kind, uh, basically nobody's going to get well, okay? It's like medicine, okay? So what we have to do is say there has to be something more than putting people in a cage. That's just my take on it. Uh, they'll say anything, they'll do anything, I'm better, I'm gonna, but if you haven't really worked with them uh, and tried to change their life in a, an appreciable way, then just sitting them in a cage is not going to help them. If anything, it's going to make them worse. Okay? These boot camps, people always swear by these boot camps and stuff. You go in and you knock them around, but you don't teach them how to read and write. You're not equipping them to go out into society, okay? So it is not a deterrent, okay? And generally speaking, there is no deterrence, okay? Very ineffective. Now, in our first slide on deterrence, we see a guy in stocks. That's what we used to call shaming. Shaming. They thought that shaming was a form of, uh, of deterrence. But in the Old West... It was full of people that had been shamed out in the east. So what they do? They just move somewhere and start over and keep doing their same old evil deeds. A few people learn, but a lot of them don't. So uh, any kind of shaming is not the way to go. The other picture in there is a lady in a dunking chair. And what I'm doing is touching on a little bit of history there. Uh, a lot of times they thought that women were devils and they would dunk them in a dunking chair like this. It was very common. They felt like they were misbehaving. They had the audacity to say that I'm a woman, hear me roar, uh, and, you know, I have rights. I, I'm the equal of any man. Well, you know, you'd be burned at the stake for that. You're a witch. Uh, and then, so this modern way that we think and we live today, we take a lot for granted, believe me. Well, the other picture here in deterrence is a picture of a dorm I was in one time. I had to go talk to a client, and this is exactly what it looked like. This is just a picture I got from Google Images, but this looks like a scene I saw in Carlisle, Indiana, in uh, what we call the Wabash Correctional Facility. They would actually taken the dining hall and converted it into uh, a huge dormitory with three high bunks all through it. And you know, the thing on that is that um, I was never more scared than I was. There was a guard sitting at a desk on an elevated kind of a dais or platform at the other end of the room, but he was so far away, I realized that I could be dead before I ever got over to talk to him. Uh, and so um, the thing about, uh, you know, Deterrence, you see this one, it talks about uh, it's ineffective but still supported. Uh, you know, basically uh, most experts in the field, which are uh, highly regarded criminal justice experts, think that the death penalty, for example, is not a deterrent to murder. Like I said, a lot of times murder is an impulsive crime. Uh, there's different kinds of murder. There's obviously planned murders. Uh, those are what we call premeditated, but a lot of murders were uh, irrational acts in the course of another crime or uh, just pure unmitigated anger that was uncontrolled. So uh, the same picture appears again in incapacitation. There is a theory out there uh, in terms of uh, uh, as a, at another uh, part of this deterrence theory. Specific deterrence is toward the individual. And this is the population, that the population will be learning. In other words, you make an example out of this individual, and it will cause the general population to say, well, I'm not going to commit a crime. I don't want to go to prison. There's a lot of people that do say that, I'm sure. But they go to bed, they sleep, they wake up. Did the Colts win? Yes. Okay. Well, oh, I completely forgot about deterrence. Okay. I'm moving on with my life. I live by impulse. Where am I going to find food today? Hunter-gatherer thinking like cavemen, okay? Uh, we can never really pull, fully get away from that. Incapacitation is we just put them in a box with cage-like situation 
and put them in there and just leave them there. This is, whoops, gotta, gotta do better on that. <laughs> so anyway, here we go, we got a guy And he's got his hands on the bars here, okay? So, you know, we just put him in a cage. This is incapacitation. Incapacitation, okay? So what that means is you put him in there, instead of putting him in there for like three years, well, let's make it 15, okay? And what we really mean is this is really like 18 months with good time, okay? Uh, well, then that makes this like 7.5 years uh, for stealing a chicken, okay? Uh, but that violates these uh, terms of proportionality that we already learned, okay? But especially when we've got some people uh, and, you know, we have these chronic thieves, chronic thieves, and a lot of them are really poor people. You know, they run out of food stamps in the third week of the month, and what are they going to do for their family for a week? And, you know, they got no job skills. They're marginally, mentally uh, incapacitated. Let's say they've got an IQ of about 65 or 70. Out in the world, nobody's helping them. But they're able to have children. So they've got a wife and kids. Uh, and so they've got to do something while they go out and they steal food. Folks, I saw this in city and municipal courts every month. Okay, around the first of every month, we'd have a flock of people come in that were constantly committing thefts. Not very bright, nice kids, nice people, but that's just how they handled it. That was their situation. They thought they were Robin Hood. They were going to, you know, make up for the fact that Uncle Sammy wasn't taking good enough care of them. Uh, and, you know, that, that's what you find a lot in criminal justice. You have people with some kind of mental incapacity or mental inability make up a large percentage of people that just land in prison. You saw them in your high school, uh, you know, and they just drift away and get into trouble. Uh, other people, though, have skills. They have capabilities. You know that they have native intelligence, and you've got to look at those people and try to help them to learn to get away from this. Uh, and so there's some people in the criminal justice system that can't really be helped. Uh, honestly, the real help for those people would be in the mental health system. But the mental health system argues that it's so overburdened at this point uh, that there's really not that much they can do. You know, I don't know. I've looked at it. Caseloads of 40 in the mental health system. Well, you know, we've got a hard job to do. Well, caseloads of 300 in the probation system. What's wrong with that picture? So, and a lot of the people that you'll find in there are operating at a very low level, so they can't really uh, do much. So, you know, you just say that third crime is a charm, you know, a habitual offender. Uh, so basically you get the third offense felony, which could be a misdemeanor, but you charge it as a theft felony and so the person gets you know instead of you know there's cases out there where people have gotten life literally in California life or 15 years to life for stealing this guy stole uh, a uh, golf club a couple golf clubs and ended up in prison for 15 years to life in California I mean, it literally happened. There was another guy in either Oklahoma or Texas that did what I described, stole uh, food every year, every month, uh, every, uh, you know, third week of every month, and, and that's the same thing. He got 30 years for a third offense. It was probably really like his 10th offense, but what it was was just a pure theft shoplifting of uh, food, okay, because he couldn't find food. Uh, that's normally punished at three years, okay. Now, what, what is wrong with this picture? Now, some of you may say, well, he deserved it. Well, I disagree. And here's my trump card. What does this cost? What does this cost the taxpayers? It's just unbelievable. It's phenomenal. So if you had somebody that could help them, kind of a case manager type guy, let's say like maybe a probation officer, just a thought, uh, that person would help this guy along the way find other alternatives. 
Go to Salvation Army and get free food. You know, go to the township trustee, get some money, buy food. Don't buy drugs, don't buy marijuana, don't buy beer, buy food. And you know, you've got them and you're constantly managing them in probation. You make them take a urine test every so often. It costs you about three grand a year. You lock this guy up for third felony theft, it's going to cost you twenty-five to seventy-five thousand per year for all those years. And we're talking thirty in my state at least, that's fifteen actual serve. Other states, that could be another number like twenty. You know, so you know, fifteen years at thirty-five thousand or six, seven, ten years at three thousand, you know. So basically, you know, the choice is yours. Uh, personally, uh, just from the pure utilitarian aspect, as far as keeping the cost down for the taxpayer, I would prefer to try these case manager and probation approaches uh, where you try to help the person learn how to live in society without having to resort to theft. And here again, what is that word again? Learn, that means education. So even people with limited capabilities and skills can be taught the basic needs of life. Their mother never taught them, their dad never taught them, somebody needs to teach them. And so if you keep track of them, I mean, I've seen cases where this has worked. I know a guy that's a social worker friend of mine, chief probation officer, and he's worked with a guy in a guardianship for like 20, 25 years, where he just kind of took care of this guy, took him under his wing, make sure that he doesn't get in trouble. He met him in juvenile court of all things, but he's taken care of this guy his whole life just by being his guardian. Uh, okay, uh, look at other things what we call alternatives to incarceration or ATI, uh, incapacitation here again, experts compare this get tough incapacitation approach to the New York uh, ATI approach. Oregon, for example, went and jumped fully into this incapacitation approach. They saw some improvement, but the actual fabulous improvement is in the ATI, alternatives to incarceration, that have been started in New York. And New York is really going full bore on this. They've had tremendous success in lowering the crime rate in New York. Uh, other states like Alabama and different states are continuing to use the incapacitation theory. Uh, no wonder they can never get anywhere in terms of uh, uh, as a state because they don't value education. They don't even value the dollar. Uh, they're, they bought into this whole get tough on crime thing. Well, retribution is another theory and that is the get even theory, retribution. Retribution is uh, what we often call eye for an eye, eye for an eye. And there's a great quote in my PowerPoint that I want to refer you to, uh, and that is the um, quote by Gandhi. And what does Gandhi say about uh, eye for an eye? All that eye for an eye does is make the whole world blind, okay? Uh, and basically, uh, it just causes blindness, eye for an eye. And you'll see people, I've talked to a lot of guys in the military, I'm still affiliated with the National Guard uh, through what I call a Guard Reserve, and basically uh, they've told me stories, students, different people, you know, you see so many people walking around in Iraq with one hand, and you know, they lost a hand because they said something out of turn or they stole something, uh, and basically the same way, if you look at something you're not supposed to look at, they put out your eye, you know. So uh, this retribution approach, once again, not not good. Uh, any kind of an approach, eye for an eye, that's just based on pure emotion is a failure. Uh, look at the Mary Surratt case that's also shown. She had a boarding house. Uh, the assassins who killed Lincoln, including John Wilkes Booth, met at her house, had breakfast there a few times, and uh, basically uh, she was swept up in the net of people because she ran the house where the people were and uh, many many people there's generations of people you can look up on Google you know was Mary Surratt guilty answer no that's a vast uh, response by many people who have relatives that were there 
Uh, and I often thought that this was a very hysterical approach. Uh, this is one of the first and few times that a woman, for example, was hanged in our society. And it's very sad because we let emotions take over. I mean, Lincoln was obviously very much loved and appreciated, especially at that time. There were times when he wasn't that well thought of, but during that time he had successfully prosecuted the war, uh, the Civil War, and you know we're bringing it to an end. And so there was an era of good feeling, and then here he gets murdered. So basically, uh, there was an outrage, it was a rash decision, and not very well thought uh, out. Um, objectivity is the key in this business. You've got to try to take a detached approach. Tough to do when you're dealing with things like child molesting or any kind of like a teenage girl gets murdered. Uh, when I'm teaching my serial killer class, for example, uh, the things you see, it's just uh, terrible. But on the other hand, there is a certain level of trying to understand uh, and classify the different kinds of serial killers, you know, get inside their head to a certain extent and figure out why do they do this. There's a lot of different reasons. It's totally another story, but um, we move on. Retribution, not the way to go. Restoration is another uh, one of these possibilities, and that is a coming thing. But before we get into restoration, I want to touch on rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, again, is, and I've already been stressing this, uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but rehabilitation involves uh, basically training, education, and counseling, okay? So what you have to do is a series of things to help people. This is like job training, okay? And education is just your basic skills, maybe GED on up. Some people actually get college uh, degrees, you know, as the time they're on probation. And that, of course, helps them. And then counseling. We have anger, anger issues. Uh, and then uh, as an adjunct, you know, we can have, uh, you know, anger. We can have uh, uh, domestic violence. We can have uh, even child molesters. Uh, a number of different things. Uh, and then, of course, another one is abuse, uh, different uh, products, alcohol, uh, drugs, and this type of things. And that's where, an, as an adjunct to this, we need the urinalysis. And so we uh, do constant urine tests. People say, oh, but you can get around these urine tests. Well, um, you know, this has gotten tougher and tougher. We've gotten tougher on these urine tests. A lot of times we have a set certain case manager whose job it is uh, is to just watch the guys uh, give their urine into a bottle in the bathroom. We have females that watch the women uh, put their urine into a container. So uh, there just has to be a constant kind of a drop dead uh, and tight restrictions on your analysis. And it sounds probably pretty crazy. You're like, I didn't bargain to get into the well. Let me tell you right now that that's all part of the process. So, um, you know, training, education, counseling, uh, urine testing. Uh, some other important things that we mentioned earlier is uh, where we talk about risk assessment and we can do, you know, repetitive risk assessment. You know, even if we get into it like an intensive program, like a day reporting program, <coughs> Electronic monitoring, all the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> electronic monitoring, or others call it remote electronic monitoring. They actually have a type of uh, remote electronic monitoring called SCRAM. Now, and what that does is test, they do, they do the uh, test, they do the urine test actually through your sweat in the scram, so it's a combination. What does this do? It controls your movements. You can go home, you can go to church, you can go grocery shopping. If you get a job, you can go to work, but you gotta wear your uh, bracelet around your ankle at all times. And these have pads in them in these scram type systems. And what that does is that collects and analyzes your sweat right on your ankle and then sends the results to the home office. So SCRAM is catching on, I know in Colorado, uh, some other states. Uh, some places have been slower 
to adopt it because it's untested technology. They don't know, you know, just how useful it is. But at least in my mind, uh, it gives you uh, presence, which there's not supposed to be any presence of alcohol or drugs. You see anything at all in there, then you need to bring them in for further testing. So that can be the advantage of SCRAM. So a number of things that we can do in the area of rehabilitation. Here again, cost savings, cost savings. And it's a reduction in reoffending. So in other words, lower costs, you know, we're talking maybe six grand, six K versus let's say 30 as kind of an average K a year, 30 K for prison, 6K for any kind of uh, rehabilitation programs, okay? And then uh, we also lower uh, reoffending, okay? So, um, you know, you can lower uh, criminals getting back into trouble for crime, okay? So, the two big reasons why rehabilitation, you know, does work and it can work. And so, uh, you know, crime is at a lower ebb right now than it's ever been since the early uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, crime was stable from the 20s up through the 60s and 70s. Then all of a sudden it launched into a big uh, upward uh, climb, a lot of it based on drugs uh, and this type thing. But uh, it's kind of reached a constant level at the top and now it started to drop around 1990. And so some things we can do, I think, to further push it down is uh, in the area of education, counseling, uh, job training, uh, and working on these substance abuse problems. Uh, in a worst case scenario, we use electronic monitoring. Now, there are some people, violent offenders, who hurt people really bad, rapists, murderers, people like that, have to go to prison. But you don't have to keep building more and more prisons. You can take your drug users out, you can take a lot of your property crimes out, and put them back on the street with you know constant monitoring and uh, save the taxpayer a lot of money. Uh, also look real quick at restoration like we talked about. Restorative justice, really big. And this one uh, picture here, we show this lady is hugging this guy. If you notice in this other one, she's talking to him along with a couple of observers. Uh, and this is actually, the lady in the hat is a victim and the guy on the right actually is the one that harmed her, but he has come to be her friend and she has seen him so many times that she's just trying to help him uh, and bring him along and make him a law-abiding citizen. And that's the old thing about restoration is a lot of these people, older people and stuff, are lonely and they need a project and sometimes you bring them in and get them involved in this restorative justice and next thing you know you change their thinking and you change the criminal's thinking because they both know that they're both people uh, and they need each other, they shouldn't try to take advantage of each other, okay? The other one is just a small picture of what we would call uh, group therapy or mediation, where people are trying to help others improve their lives. Well, in conclusion, you know, we've covered all these different points. Some of them don't work at all. Some of them work better than others. Uh, and honestly, um, I take this uh, uh, a position. Uh, I'm sold on education. I've told you that in videos already. And I believe that education can be the key. Now, I'm not so foolish to think that everybody can be educated or that everybody will choose to be good. Don't get me wrong. I know there's hard cases. What I'm really saying is we need to sort better to try to boil down this whole number uh, and prioritize better so that the cases where people are really bad, uh, we can spend the money on them that we have to just to keep them out of society. So in that context, I believe in incapacitating the ones where there doesn't seem to be any hope. But for many of these people that are just being dismissed and thrown away, discarded lives, I just don't see that. I think that there is hope, there is a future. So what I'm saying is that we need to use these ATI type methods uh, to try to sort people better and find uh, that there is hope. Notice in one of my videos there, I've got uh, Hawaii's got a program out there called Hope. 
So these are alternatives and we need to check those out and try to use them as often as possible so that we're doing the most good for the most people just like Jeremy Bentham told us to back in the 18th century. Thanks for watching. Be back later with something new. Enjoyed talking to you. Bye now.